There is a pervading sense of both the present and the future in all of our readings. Indeed, they share a seemingly apocalyptic language with their repeated and related phrases of and on that day, and the days will come, of the unremembering of former things, and the creation of new heavens and a new earth. The second letter to the Thessalonians, and even more so Luke's gospel, however, throw us into a time warp. While they both surely point to an anticipated not yet, there is still something left to do in the already. Communal work for the Thessalonians bold testimony for the Lucan disciples. In this way, the readings are not strictly apocalyptic, as much as they are an exhortation about how believers ought to behave in the here and now, to behold, believe, be here, and be ready. This is work in which believers surely do not labor in vain, as Isaiah puts it, but accomplishes that for which it is purposed. While belief in a new heaven and a new earth, in the world to come, is paramount, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians and us that there is still something left to do in this world before we get to the one beyond. It's easy to imagine that Paul was implying something more than simply paid labor in his warning against idleness. The Greek word translated here as work is used more than 20 times in his letters with various connotations. While the emphasis of this chapter of the letter is on idleness, it also implies the opposite, diligence and commitment as well as work and labor. If we consider the work and labor of Paul's ministry so clearly in service to proclaiming the good news, work and idleness take on deeper meanings. In addition, the accompanying reminder of being in service to each other is so typical of Paul and his theology. Whatever the nature of the work to which he calls his readers and hearers, it is for each of them individually, but perhaps even more so communally. Be here and be diligent together is the underlying message I hear in this passage. This and other similar verses of Scripture, and especially our Gospel reading from Luke, have long been interpreted as apocalyptic, as predicting some future end time when there will be a new heaven and a new earth, as the prophet Isaiah reminds us this morning, when the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. And while I think that we are to find assurance in this concept, it can be both comforting and unsettling. Just looking around at the sheer beauty of where we live here in western Maine, the lakes, the mountains, the sky, it's hard to imagine not remembering such a heavenly place as this. But the truth is we all build all sorts of temples we admire and hope will never fall, from this lakeside church to our warm homes, or to financial security, certain memories, or even an idea of political leadership. But I think we miss an important point in this morning's texts if all we take away is that things will be better some day, that the end is near and we ought to be prepared. First of all, Jesus himself cautions us against this kind of interpretation, saying, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say the time is near. Do not go after them. Elsewhere in the Gospels, Jesus is even more direct about the futility of predicting or knowing when. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven. Secondly, Luke was writing after the temple had already fallen. He was not prophesizing. He was writing to and for a persecuted minority of beleaguered believers under the tyranny of political oppression. There is something about our readings this morning that makes me recall a favorite story amongst the fables and fairy tales of which I grew up hearing, in which the main character is a certain bird named Chicken Little. Perhaps you remember it, too. Chicken Little was out walking one day when an acorn fell from a branch above onto his head. 
The sky must be falling, the silly bird falsely and rashly assumed, and ran to tell anyone who would listen, first a hen, then a duck, then a goose, and a gander, who all in turn believe his cry, and a general freakout and mass hysteria ensues. Eventually their paths cross that of a fox, and they share their news of impending doom also with him, seeing and seizing the opportunity the unscrupulous fox invites the gullible birds into the safety of his den. None of them, of course, waddle back out. So what does fear-mongering and hysteria taste like, you wonder? Kind of like chicken, says Foxy Loxy. Or goose, or duck. Fowl. There are versions of this classic tale that go back to the oral folk traditions that preceded the printed and illustrated story storybooks with which we all grew up. But every version ends the same. Everyone else is eaten by the fox. Perhaps one of the more interesting adaptations is an animated short film made by Walt Disney Pictures in 1943, commissioned by the U.S. government and released during World War II, in which Foxy Loxy is a thinly disguised Adolf Hitler, who incites unreasonable fear and mass hysteria to his advantage. Indeed, the name Chicken Little and the story's refrain, The Sky is Falling, have long been used to refer to people who are either unreasonably afraid or those who intentionally whip up fear and chaos, as well as the mistaken belief that calamity and disaster are imminent. And the operating question of this children's story, should we believe everything we hear, seems sadly relevant in the very grown-up world of today's spin doctors and political talking heads with all their hyperbole and rhetoric and misinformation fake news, and outright lies. Now, it isn't the sky that is falling in our gospel reading this morning, but something just as unimaginable, the temple. Although what that means to the characters involved is the same, the end of the world as they know it. The disciples in this story are admiring the grandeur and the wonder of the temple, perhaps the central point of ancient Judaism, and for many, what connected them to God. The temple was massive, formidable, and impressive. Some estimate that its outer court alone could hold 400,000 people. It represented not only the sovereignty of God, but stability itself. And Jesus tells them, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. These verses from Luke are hardly the most consoling passage of Scripture we have in the Bible, even with their concluding lines about the safety of the hairs on our heads and the gaining of our souls. Even Jesus' answer to the disciples' question about when the temple stones would fall is blunt and to the point. There will be no angels or trumpets, no mystical signs. They will know the time has come, Jesus basically says, when the temple courtyard becomes a battleground, when war and insurrection break out. Jesus is no chicken little. We are a people of the book, and we know how the story ends. The temple was, in fact, eventually surrounded by legions of soldiers of the Roman army and razed to the ground. Not a single stone left on another, every one of them thrown down. And what we know here and now that the disciples did not yet know is that even before such unthinkable destruction, the temple of Jesus' body would also be thrown down, betrayed, beaten and nailed to a cross. While the most apparent imagery of this morning's readings may be that of former and latter things, the underlying message I hear is one about listening carefully and paying attention to what voices we pay heed to in our lives, about listening for the one true voice that really matters in our lives, the voice of our Savior. And having listened, to live out what we really believe right here and right now. This isn't about predicting the end, but seizing the present moment in which we are to share our faith, not in buildings and symbols, 
but in God and Christ Jesus, to build up not literal, literal stones of any temple, but the living stones of relationship. There is no call to arms here, no admonition to build an underground bunker like some doomsday preppers and store up goods, no caution not to be left behind. Our focus ought not be on what is about to happen or some future transcendence, rather faithful discipleship and testimony in the here and now. The point is that the present moment is an opportunity for bold testimony, for fortitude even in the face of adversity. Until that ultimate day which will eventually come, Jesus calls those who follow him to be ready, even as they, as we, steadfastly remain and remind. To witness and to testify, to behold, believe, be here, and be ready. In the end, there is only the call to the beautiful work of being present for each other and for the inbreaking of the not yet. We need not, we ought not wait for the end times, Jesus says. Look, now is the acceptable time, St. Paul wrote. See, now is the day of salvation. Jesus does not urge us so much to plan and prepare in advance as he does invite us to trust in him and live out our faith right here in the present moment. We can freak the bleep out like chicken little, or we can stay the course, witness and proclaim and tell the salvific and liberating truth of Christ, the sight-giving, captive-freeing, life-renewing, ever-unfolding love of God in the world. May it be so. Amen.